it's when we pull into the supermarket parking lot that the shakes finally settle down. It takes a couple of minutes of controlled breathing and meditation before I can talk. Thanks, I manage to mumble. My mother nods at me and plants a kiss on my forehead. I'm really proud of you. You did really well coming here. I forced a pained smile. I'm sure the doctors will give us something to help you. Like some medication or something, she continues. I'm sure they have something for this. Agoraphobe, whatever you have. Another nod. She plants another kiss on my forehead. I love you, she whispers, before exiting the car and leaving me inside. It's fine. She made the right call. This is comfortable. This is better than the outside. But she's wrong about one thing. The same way all the doctors I've seen are. It's not a fear of open spaces. It's a fear of the sky. Ten years ago, I somehow found myself living in a commune called Abraham, 80 kilometers west of Coffs Harbour, Australia. It's exactly how you'd imagine it to be. Hippies, organic farming, and a lot of hairy armpits. I told myself that this was a good change, that this is what I needed. The commune was in the middle of a clearing. After 15 k's of dirt and mud, it was a place that you had to walk to. Not even the sturdiest of four-wheel drives could survive that trick. The reception was warm once I arrived. I was given a space to lay my bedrolls down, and I was immediately given work. Smiles and backpats all round. Good on you for getting out of the rat race, they all told me, with smiles. Everybody shook my hand. I felt a warmth rise from inside me as I made my way to my sleeping quarters. It didn't occur to me, not once on that day. I never found out who anyone was. No one told me their names. I somehow accepted all of it, without question. I spent a good three months not really talking with anybody and just thinking of the work I had to do. Six, seven hours of cultivating plants and picking mushrooms followed by passing out until the morning. It was slightly lonely, but there was a comfort in the rhythmic quality of life it had. Everybody did the same thing, except everybody attended a church late at night. I was never into spiritualism, so I happily skipped that part. Everybody had a right to whatever they wanted to believe in. It just wasn't for me. No one talked me into coming. Life went on, and then I met Hannah. After taking a break from farm work one day, I decided to wander around the commune. I found a track, one that snuck out towards a dense copse of trees. Idly, I decided to follow it. It led to a beaten down shack, all made of corrugated roofing just above a hill. Around the hill, were many boulders, each one massive, each with a different shape. Some had high ropes tied around them. About 50 metres from where it stood was a rock, embossed with a crude drawing of what looked like an altar. Curiosity got the better of me, so I made my way up the hill. As I approached, I heard a voice from behind me say, You look different. Also, you're not supposed to be here. The first thing I noticed was her huge swath of wild, reddish hair. A face marred by freckles. She wore a dress that looked like it was made of burlap sacks, and she looked bored. Uh, hi, I mumbled. I'd forgotten how to talk to people over the past few months. My name's Carl, by the way. She smirked. Okay, you're awkward, but you gave me your name. You're still different, 
she said with a chuckle. My name's Hannah, by the way. Come on in. I'll make you some tea. Hannah asked for my story, and so I told her most of it. Five years of working in technology ground me into a severe depression. A crushing burnout that left me in need of somewhere more tangible, somewhere natural. A place where I could disengage and turn off. So, what's your story? I asked at the end of it. I was addicted to WoW, she said, shrugging. World of Warcraft, I mean. I spent two years logging 350 days of playtime, and so my folks shipped me off out here, in Abraham. You sound like you loathe it here, I replied. I do, I really do, she hissed. My parents had this weird idea that people who lived here were more in touch with reality, more real. But it's really bullshit, you know? You want to know what I think? I shrugged. Sure. She stretched out her arms in a sweeping gesture, as if to make some kind of proclamation. It doesn't matter how people live or how they choose to live. People will be people, and people will always be dicks. Write that on my tombstone, Carl. We laughed together after that. Laughed together for a good while. It was the first time I did so in a long time, and it felt good. Hannah, if you hate it so much here, why don't you just leave? I asked her. She looked at me, quizzically. What do you mean leave? I'm the lamb, she said. I raised an eyebrow, and she stared back at me, astonished. So, you really are different, she said, trailing off. After that, I began to visit Hannah every chance I got. We'd just hang out, while the hours away while we talked about the old world, a term we used for the world outside. She would talk about video games or movies from years ago from before the time she came over to Abraham. I could tell she missed the old world very dearly. As we got to know each other better, I started to discover that she was this funny, if slightly bitter, individual. I started looking forward to the time we'd spend together. She'd make fun of the other people in the commune, talk of the many ways she hates Abraham, take swipes at the world in general. And me... I'd just sit there and absorb all of this eagerly. It had been so long since I'd had a connection this easy, this effortless, with, well, anyone. And I was grateful for that. Those times, they remained prized in my memory. It was that sliver of happiness. Before the time she got sick, I opened the door to her shack after multiple knocks of not getting a reply. As soon as I opened the door, I found her collapsed in a sweating heap beside her bed. I pressed my palms against her forehead. She was burning with a high fever. Hannah? Hannah? I said as I shook her shoulders. She lightly stirred as sweat dripped out of her temples. We need to get you to a doctor. She looked at me, eyes glazed, and then shook her head. No, she mouthed. Just put me back on the bed. I nodded. I swept my arm under her body and tried to ease her into the bed. A shock hit me as I felt her weight. She was light, incredibly so, easily the weight of a small child. Jeez, I muttered. She winked at me and whispered hoarsely, I know, right? Most men like that. Huh, we still need to get you to a doctor, I said. She smirked. Didn't you know? Abraham has no doctors. The next one's about 80 k's away. I kissed her on the forehead, tasting the salt of her sweat on my lips. God, 
I'm starting to hate this place. Can I stay here for the night? I just want to make sure you're okay, I said. As long as you tell me a story so I can sleep, she whispered, smiling lazily. What kind of story? She knitted her brows for a moment, and then she said, Tell me the one about how we get away from this place. While I slept, I dreamed of the story I told her. It was us, together, living in a small apartment by the city, surrounded by people. I came home from a job that I liked, to find her on the couch, with her thumbs stuck to a video game controller. She plants a kiss on my cheek as I sit down next to her. When I stirred awake, I felt happy. When I opened my eyes, she was floating. Carl, I don't know what's happening. Carl, she said with a panicked voice. I bolted backwards, my mouth agape. Hannah was before me, floating in the air. Her body kept bumping against the corrugated iron roofs, bouncing back, then hitting the roof again in slow motion. She twisted and struggled. I, I'm going to go get someone. I don't know what's happening, I muttered. I'll get someone from the commune. I'll get someone for you. Please don't leave me, Carl. I'm so scared. I grabbed her arms and legs and pushed her against the bed. She grabbed onto the bedpost with a force that turned her knuckles white. She was shivering. Hannah, I'm going to be back. I promise. We're going to get you help. Okay? She nodded at me, and I ran. My thighs and my shins, they burned as I sprinted towards the commune. Thorns and vines cut their way against the skin of my knees, but I was too focused, focused on getting someone who could help. When I came out of the trail, towards the vegetable fields, I screamed, Something's happening to Hannah. I need help. A couple of the men in the fields, they quickly turned towards me. Some dropped their tools. Soon, there were six, seven men around me. It's Hannah. She's... I don't know what's happening to her, I said, gasping. Who do I talk to? You've been with her, one of the men said. Yeah, what... I said, baffled at the reply. Look... I just need someone who can... You've been with the lamb, another said. I don't know what you're talking about, but I just need... It was at that point, I felt a sharp blow against the back of my head. I then felt pain, and then I felt nothing. When I came to, it was dark, and everything felt wet. I had an overpowering pain bloom at the back of my neck. I ran my fingers against my hair, and I saw caked blood when I looked at them. Hannah, think about Hannah. It took a while for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. I was in the middle of a shallow ditch, left in mud. Over the distance, I could see the shack where Hannah was. I ran. I ran against all reason, without thinking of what I was going to do next. All I knew was that she was in trouble, and I needed to be next to her. All I knew was that I had to get her out of here. And so, I ran, until I had clear sight of that hill where she lived. I stopped to catch my breath, and I caught sight of a crowd of people, 50 metres in front of the shack, all of them with torches, their heads bowed. There was a chorus of muttering, as if they were all in prayer. A man stood in front of them, with an open book in his hands, and just by the shack was Hannah. She was floating. No, it was as if she was going to fall into the sky. Her body, it hung upwards, 
while a line of rope was tied to her wrist on one end and one of the boulders to the other. The man who had the book, he walked towards her, holding a pair of large metal shears in one hand. He looked up at Hannah and smiled, and then he started to cut the rope. I ran faster. I sprinted, my legs on fire, and my body singing with pain. But I sprinted all the same, towards Hannah. My heart sank when the man was at the last, frayed ends of the rope, and he opened the shears once more to cut the rest of it. So I closed my eyes, and I screamed, and I begged my body to go faster. Please, faster, with my arms stretched out, and I jumped, and I felt my fingers close against something. And when I opened my eyes, I was hanging in the air. I looked down, and there was a crowd of people screaming at me, four, five meters below. I looked up, and there was Hannah. She gave me a pained smile, her knuckles white against her end of the rope. Behind her was the bottomless pit of the night sky. You came for me, she said. We're going to get out of this place, remember? I said as I struggled to get a grip on the rope. She smiled, but parts of her face were twisted in pain. Tears welled up against her eyes and then fell upwards, droplets going towards the stars. Her feet hung helplessly. You can't fix this. You can't do anything about this, Carl. I need you to stay with me, I said. You're the reason I need to get out of this place. She gave me a pained smile. For some reason, my mind wandered back to the dream of us living together in a quiet place somewhere where we can finally find our peace. I felt the world move as if nothing else mattered. Not the men below, not the drop, not the many ways we tried to escape ourselves. It was only me and her. You don't need me to leave this place, she said sadly. What you need is to let go. And then she did. The rest is both a blur and in slow motion, forever stamped into memory. The screams of my begging, the drop of five meters, and the feeling of the ground hitting me at velocity. Her silhouette with her wild hair and the dirty white of her dress falling upwards into the endless void of the sky, the mix of love and sadness in her eyes, the last second flash of terror. And then, as consciousness began to fade out, the crowd of men yelping in joy, the sight of them floating upwards into the air, mouthing hallelujah as they reached greater heights, the nervous muttering as they ascended faster and faster upwards, the shrieking horror as they too fell upwards until they looked like just a flock of birds way up in the clouds until I couldn't see them at all. Then, silence as the commune of Abraham was suddenly empty. <laughs>